Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady, it's Paul's Security Weekly. This segment is sponsored by the SANS Institute, the most trusted source for computer security training, certification, and research. Visit SANS.org to learn more. And by Tenable Network Security, creators of Nessus, the world's best vulnerability scanner. Jumpstart your security program today and evaluate Security Center CV, the continuous monitoring solution. Visit them online at Tenable.com. Now, fire up a packet capture, pour yourself a beer, and give the intern control of your botnet. Here's your host, the person who likes to make funny comments about himself, Mr. Paul Asadorian. That's me. Oh, wait. Yes, I'm the only one in studio who is a regular host on the show. Welcome, everyone. This is Security Weekly, episode 414 for Thursday, April 16th, 2015. I have some illustrious hosts on the lines via Skype. Mr. Michael Santarcandjello is on the line. <laughs> <laughs> is that a thing? Can you get Jello in the can? Is that like a Southern thing? I bet you, if you could, you probably could in South Carolina. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go test it now. And yeah. if, if I can, I'm buying you some. <laughs> <laughs> we well, could just put it here, a little picture of you on it. It'd be great. It's Michael <laughs> Santarcandjello, right there. I did come up with a funny intro for Mike. I mean, give me some credit. Mr. Not You Kevin is here as well <laughs> from Boston, Massachusetts. Are they going to have, Oli- have the Olympics there, Kevin? I don't know. I, I think the city's still a little decided on, or undecided on that one. Yeah, I heard they like, didn't would, want it there. Like, they're like, a lot of people away. don't want it. I think the, the, the MBTA, which is the local transit authority here, is so broken that I think no one wants yeah. the Olympics here because of that. Because they didn't have to drive. And people are like, don't park your car over here. <laughs> That's exactly what happens every time you walk out the door. Someone yells that. <laughs> that sounds of people saying that all the time. <laughs> oh, boy. A couple of quick announcements. Uh, ready to learn combat firmware analysis? Register for my Black Hat course, Embedded Device Security Assessments, a two-day course hosted at Black Hat Las Vegas. Registration includes breakfast, lunch, access to the Black Hat briefings, business hall, sponsor workshops, sponsor sessions, and arsenal talks. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash IOT to register today. Larry is teaching all kinds of fun stuff, wireless ethical hacking and defense coming up in Orlando, and especially in Austin, Texas. They're making a big push for Austin. You should visit Austin, Texas. It's a cool city. Larry can be your instructor. You can do net wars. There's all kinds of fun stuff going on there, so go to sands.org and check that out. And don't forget to register for B-Sides Boston coming up on May 9th. I will be presenting something about robots, ninjas, and pirates, so (laughs) check that out. It'll be fun. I promise. On to our feature interview for this show. Mr. John Callis is a cryptographer, software engineer, and entrepreneur. He is the co-author of many crypto and security systems, including OpenPGP, DKIM, ZRTP, Skyd, and 3Fish. He's co-founded several startups, including PGP, Silent Circle, and Blackphone. He is fond of... How do you say that? Le, not Lucia. That's the cigar. Le, 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 how do you say that, John? Uh, what, what is it? It's the cameras. Oh, Leica. Leica. I was going to say that. Leica cameras, Morgan sports cars, and Berman cats. John, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. John, so how did you get your start in information security? Well, I I was an operating system guy. I I was at DEC, worked on VMS, and started doing things with that. And then moved into doing collaboration tools. People didn't want to do collaboration on the then relatively new internet, and there was no SSL, so I started learning cryptography so that I could protect my network from being sniffed. Mm. It's interesting you mentioned VMS, John, because when I used to work for a lottery company, it ties into one of our stories we have this week about a lottery being hacked. The lottery company that I worked for used VMS, and um, there was this default password of baseball. Is, was that is that just like a 
a thing. That's not a thing in the operating system, right? That no, was it wasn't a, a thing in the operating system. It was just like a cultural thing. It was like it baseball. was a cultural thing. Yeah. yeah. VMS was was really cool though. It was uh, it stayed around for a long time in that in that setting. It did. Um, so, um, what kind of prompted your decision to create PGP software and really pursue that path? Well, I had been working at at Apple, and this was when Steve Jobs came back, and I was in the research group, and we'd been doing collaboration tools. We knew that he was going to be cutting down all of the collaboration stuff, and um, I was looking to go maybe into the operating system group, but a friend of a friend of mine said that PGP was hiring. So I applied there, and they hired me in as a system architect, and then I became chief scientist and then CTO. Excellent. So for those who are creating security software today, what advice uh, do you have for them regarding, you know, open source versus commercial commercialization? Of course, there's some history with PGP there as well, right? Right. I mean, there the two are not are not incompatible. You can have open source that is commercial. You can also have various types of open source. I mean, you know, of course, the OSI compatible licenses like GPL, BSD, et cetera, but there are other licenses that one could use that are not theirs and people can still do what they really need to do, which is to be able to look at your code, be able to build it for themselves and analyze that it really does what they want. Um, the other thing is to decide whether or not this is a business or a hobby that we have seen over the last year, for example, that there have been a lot of security problems that at the root of them is that nobody's paying for anything. Uh, we saw that after a lot of the OpenSSL problems, the guys who did OpenSSL were getting like $7,000 a year, which, you know, <clears throat> doesn't pay for a lot. No, that's, a, that's like our bar bill for one week. Yeah. <laughs> Um, similarly, the, the TrueCrypt guy, whoever that was, f finally threw up their hands, and I think that it was all related to they got $70,000 in some sort of project to do an analysis of the code, and I'll bet the guy hadn't gotten $70,000 ever in mm. total. And you can kind of understand that somebody would say, you know, really, why don't you just do this yourself? We also saw that Werner Koch, who is the guy who is the main developer of GNU PG, was not making a lot of money. And that was very nice that people started contributing to him and a number of companies said that they would give him a stipend. There's an awful lot of software that is the backbone of what we do on the internet, particularly in security, mm -hmm. that is literally a labor of love for someone. And when they decide that they want to have a mortgage, kids, yeah, yeah. buy food, the, it, it starts competing with that. So it, it seems to me that there's been this shift from when open source software was uh, when it was created and you would release the code and people would contribute and help you with that. It seems that when we get to today that more people are using the software but not necessarily contributing back. Is that like a cultural shift that's happened and what's contributed to that? I think that's always been the case. There's always been mm. far more people who were using than people who were contributing it. That the successful open source projects have had some sort of sponsorship behind the scenes. I mean, for example, if you look at WebKit, which most of the web browsers in the world do, mm -hmm. it's been funded by Apple and Google for years. Um, the compilers that we use LLVM, Clang, GNU CC, those have all been funded by companies behind the scenes. That you have a power law relationship with them just like anything else where 10% of the projects get like 90% of the money and most projects mm -hmm. aren't getting any, any contribution and aren't getting any money to them either. Mm -hmm. So, Go ahead, know, Mike. Well, I just, I think it's a really important point. And, and as I'm listening to this and thinking about it, 
You know, John, when you, you mentioned we have to decide whether this is a hobby or, or otherwise, how much of it then is that we as an industry don't do a, a good enough job of marketing and promoting th these projects that we depend on, but that maybe people don't pay attention to? I think there's something of a tragedy of the commons in it, that mm -hmm. people will use an open source project because it is free as in beer rather than anything else, and they didn't want to pay anything for it, and they just assume mm. that somebody else is paying for it. Um, so, John, a, a lot of people use the PGP today, whether it be commercial or, or open source variants. I like to think that mostly for good, but certainly there are people who use it to hide evil things. When this point comes under scrutiny, like, what's your response to that? Well... Communication is something that is a basic human right, that we live in a world where to be able to talk to somebody, we all have contacts that are all around the world. We're using something like, like voice calling, we're using email, and we really have a right to not be spied on that there are no good guys or bad guys in any of this. We know that everyone is doing it from all of the governments to criminals around the world and how do we protect ourselves. We don't go and have background checks at the restaurant. You know, we, we, don't, we, don't, we don't see what your police record is when you buy groceries. Why is it that talking to somebody is all of a sudden really dangerous? Yeah, I, I, I tend to liken that back to a hammer, right? If I make a hammer, I can't really design it to make sure that people don't bash each other in the skull with it. And... And that is, that is also part of it, and we're seeing now the, the usual pushback from law enforcement coming again. And you don't get to have something that the good guys can look in on and say um, doesn't also protect people with umbrellas in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. if, you want to, if you want to have crypto and other technologies support people around the world, no matter where they are, they have to genuinely be foolproof. Mm -hmm. Speaking of, you know, being foolproof like that, um, you know, where do we stand on the privacy versus, you know, cryptography thing? You know, of course, it um, provides a certain luxuries of privacy, but, you know, there are also certain governments that may want to infringe upon that. So, you know, how do you, how do you have uh, crypto and keep it safe so that people can use it and keep it out of the hands of, you know, prying eyes as well? Well, one of the reasons why it is good to have a project that is what I'll call source available is so that it can be publicly audited and so that we do know that nobody's putting anything bad in it. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not sure other than that what your question is. Uh, that wasn't sure either. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, so uh, many have kind of deemed PGP um, kind of a geek nerd tool. And when we talk about email encryption, they're like, yeah, you know, the, the nerds tend to use PGP. But, you know, why haven't we seen something with more widespread adoption of uh, email encryption for the average user? Um, there's no other reason than the average user doesn't want it. Mm. I mean... We are today with things like, like what goes on with GNU PG and other tools that it's kind of like if you were using the World Wide Web and what you used was curl or wget. And so you would type into the command line, download an HTML file, pipe it over to a display tool, and then go over and cut and paste a URL and paste that back into your command line again to go get the next link that you had. That a lot of people seem to think that if something is hard to use, it must be secure, and that for <laughs> mm -hmm. it really to be secure, it's absolutely got to be hard to use. Commercially with PGP, we built it to be transparent. When I rebooted PGP in 2002, the code name that we had was zero-click encryption. That, that was it. It was to be completely transparent. And I am still using my servers that's now owned by Symantec T 
today on my own mail server, which does all of my crypto for me, that, that I don't bother with keys or anything like that. I, I had somebody the other day say, can you sign my key? And it's like, oh God, how do I do this? Because I've handed my own infrastructure off to my robot servants that do a perfectly fine job for of it. Mm. Um, I know a guy who runs a company called Alt-N, and they do a mail server called mdaemon that runs on Windows. And they also recently put OpenPGP into it so you get transparent encryption and decryption. But most people seem to like the fact that it's hard to use. You know, kind of the way that, that people complain about airlines, but nobody actually wants to pay any money for a bigger seat. Mm -hmm. um, so what your current role is with Silent Circle. What can you tell our, our listeners about Silent Circle? So Silent Circle is secure communications, voice video calling, and texting. We do it on mobile devices, so that, that means Android iOS. And we deliver the service through apps that you load onto a smartphone. We do completely secure voice video calls, completely secure texting. It is all end-to-end -end crypto. We are doing it as a service because we want it to be completely transparent. It's just like using any other phone app. You can call somebody by a number, you can call them by their name, but um, you, just, you just use it the way that you would use your normal phone app, and, and everything is secure, not even we can get to anything that you're doing. Mm -hmm. and now, I'm assuming the, both people need to have the app in order to communicate, right? Yes. We have a call-out plan where you can buy a number of minutes that will go to like 80 countries. And that makes a secure call to our server that places the call on the normal telephone system. So it is partially secure and has an awful lot of uses. If you are traveling in a place where they might be spying on you or you want to be doing something on a hotel network or in some web cafe or even you are concerned about uh, vulnerabilities in the phone itself or the cellular network, you can use cellular data and have a completely secure call that will go out of your cell system into something else. Mm -hmm. What, what do you find people are most often trying to protect when they're using Silent Circle technology? Like, what's the, what are their fears that you're addressing? The, the fears are either government espionage or commercial espionage, or in a lot of cases, we just want to have a good phone communication system. Um, we spend a lot of effort to make it so that the voice quality that we do is better than a cell phone. It's mm -hmm. better than a landline. Mm -hmm. And thus, you aren't, really, you aren't really suffering as a user. As a matter of fact, um, a friend of mine who's CTO of another security company called me up and he said, I'm getting better voice quality on AT&T service in my car than I get with an AT&T voice call. And we go, yeah, that's, you know, that's, that's what we do, and that's why we're doing that. And you are also getting end-to-end -end security as well. So Paul, let me, let me, ahead, uh, you, well, yes. no, I just, no, it's so I, I'm always, your question. I was actually well, going to just ask one of your questions, so. I know this is, this is your hot, this is this topic that you're, you're all fired up about. Well, no, I just, but this, well, I'm actually going to take a step back because, so John, you were involved with PGP, uh, and now you're involved with Silent Circle. Yes. What's changed? What's I mean, like, like I'm looking abstract, not necessarily specific, but thinking about developing software, developing security software, using encryption, looking at, I mean, obviously with Silent Circle, you're already focused globally. PGP was a little tough to focus globally in the beginning. So that aside, what, what have you and the team learned that you think other people looking at projects today where they want to incorporate security from the, from the beginning? What's something that, if you kind of reflect back over the last 20 or 30 years, you go, this, this is something that's important? I think the thing that is easy to forget is that P 
people have a goal in mind, and the goal that they have in mind is not security. They are not using your system to be secure. They're using your system because they want to get some work done. And if you, if you look at um, what you do with PGP, it is that they want to be able to have email, which is the business document system of today. You know, we no longer have quote, quote, memos. We have emails. And people who want to have those secure are using PGP. People who want to do software development and put distributions out and integrity check them use PGP for that. And probably signing, signing tar blobs is done more than probably anything else with PGP because everything gets done that way. Um, we're seeing now with the mobile revolution that we all, have, we all have supercomputers in our pockets. They aren't really phones. They are handheld computers that you can also make a phone call on. And people want to do all of the things that they would be doing. They want to have their information available anywhere, which is why cloud computing is part of this. And they want to have all of that be secure. So that's driving the new things. You know, you, you, I'm just struck with an interesting uh, contrast. They don't really care about security. They want to get their job done. W we agree on that. But then they do want it to be secure. Do they use the word secure? Like when you talk to people and you're looking at business leaders around the world, when it, it, even, you know, even with Silent Circle, are, are they using the word security or do they use different words? Do they talk about protection or is there, is there a different language uh, or words that we maybe need to pick up on? There, there is a different set of words because people talk a lot about privacy and they talk about protection and they will also talk about safety. Um, mm, okay. But there are many things that people want out of security that they don't even know what they want it for. When right. I was at Apple, there was a bunch of user questionnaires that were done, and they asked people what they liked about their iPhones. Nobody ever said security, <laughs> but they did say things like, I really like that I can hand my phone to my kid while we're in line at the bank. They would say things that you couldn't do unless it was secure, but they didn't say that they wanted it to be secure. Right. And, and that goes back to um, what I believe is the human thinking about security is that we think, oh, I don't have anything that needs to be protected, I don't have anything to hide, when we all know that, that there have been studies done where you know, it's like you say, oh, let me look at, let me look at, your, phone, <laughs> at your phone and there's the passcode for your bank, the unlock code for your business, all of these other things that would be really, really valuable and you just forgot that they were there. Yeah. No, I've actually done that with people. So what it almost sounds like then too is it, it's context. If, if we say, hey, do you want this abstract thing that you're not really versed in? The answer is probably almost always going to be no, right? I think they call it the Wasson selection test. But if you talk about their, their environment and the things that they like, and then you start to list out you know, the, the branches of consequences, I suspect that the, they're going to get a little bit better about describing what they want or not without yes. calling it security. Yes. And when we're doing black phone, a new thing that we have put in it is called spaces. And it's really a virtualization system so that hmm. you can have completely separate environments where you can have the same app with different configurations in different spaces. And it's a good way that you can separate, say, work things from, from uh, personal things. But when we introduced it, I thought that you had to say things what, that were things that people would think were really cool that you do every day. So I took my tablet and I made a workspace on it and a personal space on it. And I also made a kid's space on it. And I downloaded Angry Birds, Netflix, and a couple of other things and put no passcode on it. So that you not only had my work and my personal space, but I had my anyone can watch a movie, I can hand this to my kid, 
and they can't send an email to the CEO. And <clears throat> lots of people went, oh my God, that's wonderful. And it didn't register when we said you can keep your work things and your personal things separately. It was like, yeah, yeah, I guess that's important. But when you said you can have this tablet with no passcode on it and hand it to your kids so they can watch a movie, it's now, where can I get that? When I is that going you, to be on my tablet? See, I, yeah, I, I just I, tell I, my uh, kid, like, you can have yeah. access to it when you can figure out what my passcode is. And lo and behold, now he is six and he knows my passcode very well. <laughs> yeah, I was just say, it's in my household, it was they just figured out the passcodes. Yeah. I've got four kids. And, I, and I'll tell you, like, we're always like trying to lock stuff down and it goes into airplane mode, which we've learned they just, they're smart. So they went, yeah, let me just go ahead and take it out of that, daddy, because that restricts me from the stuff I want. And, uh, and, and they can pretty much do whatever they want. So actually now I'm totally interested going, wait, yeah, yeah. you got a solution? Because exactly. really the solution is don't touch daddy's stuff. No, don't. No, I'm serious. Don't touch it. Like, that's kind of how I have to handle it. See, it works yep. for us, too. If you yep. just describe the scenario, boom, we're in. There's a, there's a really big lesson there. So I have to ask then. So black phone isn't silent circle. It's yeah, different, I was going right? to ask that, John. It, yeah, is explain. it is silent circle. Okay, so they're it the is. same company? Or? Yes. Okay. Yes, we are the same company. We started it off as a joint venture between us and Geek's phone. Mm -hmm. And... Um, in January, February, Silent Circle bought out the entire JV from Geek's phone. Yeah. And so they're, they're going off and doing some of their own very cool things like wearables, and we've taken over the phone project. I see. Yeah, a, a friend of mine, uh, Mike Kershaw, yes. works at Black Phone. Yes, he is, he is chief architect for the phone. Excellent choice. <laughs> yes. Um, so, uh, tell, so Black Phone, you uh, purchased the hardware, and it comes with the Silent Circle software and other software on it, right? Yes, it comes with Silent Circle software. It comes with, with um, prepaid subscriptions on it. It's got a local VPN. It's got cloud storage. Mm -hmm. and, and that comes prepaid along with the phone. And the phone itself is an Android phone that the way that I would describe it, since you know Mike, is this is an Android phone that comes out of the box, set up the way that Mike Kershaw would set it up for you. Yes, I want that, one. Sign me up. That is, <laughs> that is, in fact, what you're paying for, is that essentially Mike Kershaw has set up your phone. <laughs> and those listening, you want that, yes, for yes. sure. <laughs> Um, so you, you mentioned cloud there, John. So when people talk about, they say, the Internet of Things, I think really what they mean is an embedded system that ties into a mobile app that ties into some cloud application. And if you look at like, you know, the latest Veracode report that was reporting on, on those vulnerabilities, that's really the infrastructure that they were attacking. So what things can we do? Like uh, how we should be thinking about these things and what do we do about this, this problem? There's lots of points to uh, interject vulnerabilities in, in compromised security. Oh, absolutely. And, um, you know, the problem that I see with the Internet of Things is that just about all networking is the Internet. You know, now even TV and telephones mm -hmm. and other things are all being done over TCP IP. So, you know, if two things are connected together, that is Internet. And things, well, that's everything. So the Internet of Things is, in fact, anything that's got a power cord. Right, yes. Uh, um, and... Most of these devices are running some flavor of Linux or Unix anyway. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, because there are commercial things like QNX that are yep. <clears throat> essentially Unix. And w they are using standard stuff that people just threw together that, going back to the beginning, nobody's paying for because mm -hmm. they said, oh, hey, we're going to have to secure this, so we'll put OpenSSL in it. <laughs> and then there's... We need access, so we're going to put Telnet <laughs> on it because that's, that's what right. I have in my operating system. That's right. Or I'm going to, I'm going to put Nginx and a little tiny Ruby on Rails mm -hmm. thing. Yep. And, and how, you know, how do we, do, can there's the things that we can do on the phone to improve the security of that? Because, you know, I, I use the apps all the time, right? Like I have Nest and I have smart things and I'm, my phone is the primary interaction point. So are there things that we can do on the mobile side to help that 
kind of Internet of Things, cloud, mobile app problem? Well, the phones are the most secure devices you're using. iOS I would agree and with Android, that. <laughs> yes. they have a compartmentalization <laughs> system. They have sandboxing that really works. If you look at the security problems that are on mobile operating systems, it isn't that you get, except in the rare occasions when there's a horrible bug, you don't get things that are what I would call traditional malware. The problem that you get is you installed the wrong app. I mean, mm -hmm. if we want to talk about the taxonomy, all mobile malware is a Trojan horse. It is, yeah. And it is a Trojan horse that you actually installed personally yourself. Mm -hmm. It didn't even install itself behind your back. And this is a huge step forward. It is, it's, mm -hmm. it's amazingly good that these devices are that secure and we've really elevated the conversation up. What's going to have to happen is that a lot of these other devices are going to have to start inheriting this secure by design um, paradigm that is starting on mobile devices and going out from there. That's, that's really interesting. I've never thought of it that way, that in all of these new fangled things that we're all using as, as people, as consumers, and as businesses, the phone's probably the least of our, our concern. In fact, one of my questions was, you know, there are a lot of people who, in an IT setting, struggle with the mobile device management and mobile device uh, security problem. So what advice do you have for them? Well, that was my keynote that you missed. <laughs> yes, exactly. See? <laughs> and, Stupid Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, my, my advice is a lot of what I just said. These devices really are far more secure than anything that you're used to using. Mm. That your phone is more secure than your PC. Um, it also has less data on it. Most things are sitting in cloud storage where they're being protected better than they would have been protected any other way. Mm -hmm. um, the entire environment is better. They're also being updated quickly. This is one of the things that we're starting to see again come in from mobile devices is that you get over-the-air updates mm -hmm. and they get installed by default. Mm -hmm. All of the mobile OSs install by default new apps, which for me as an app developer is really incredible because it means that I can fix a bug and know that there's about a 40% uptake per day, which, you know, day one, 40% of the people are using it. Day two, 40% of the people who were, didn't get it on day one got yeah, it. Did, yeah. and, and, and it really is a half-life. Um, and within a week, almost everybody has it. And legacy software to me now is something that's three months old, not something that's 10 years. Mm. If, if you look at what goes on on PCs where people are still saying, oh, my God, what are we going to do about Windows XP, which is over a decade old? And on mobile devices, um, on iOS, you don't worry about anything other than this version and the previous version. Yeah, you know, not ninety-eight percent of everybody's <clears throat> running one of those two versions. Why? Why can't we have that on devices that we use in the home and in businesses like printers and routers and things like that? We can, and and it's 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 going to happen and it's mm -hmm. got to happen because um, that's the only way that we will survive. There's going to have to be a certain amount of user revolt that hmm. we have to demand that that be true and reward people who provide it. Otherwise, you end up with the airline seat problem. Right. You know what, John? Right. We've talked about that here before, so we let me have. ask your. Well, but let me get your opinion on it. We've talked about whether we need to empower users and, and consumers to make that request. But if that's the case, who do we have them directed to? The companies themselves? Is it does it need to become part of our our, our conversation on our selection process? Like, let, based on what you've seen and what you've done. When we say we want to have consumers drive this, where do we focus that? Or where do we start? I think that a lot of where we start is to point out that this new security paradigm, which is that things get updated quickly, they get supported for a certain amount of time, 
is being led by the people who are the most profitable companies in the world right now. <laughs> that that the best security update, and remember, the thing about security, this is one of the things that I say about Black Phone 2, is that the real thing that you're getting from us is that we're updating the software. We have fixed um, every major bug that has come out in Android or a subsystem in 72 hours. So you're getting an over-the-air update in less than three days, which makes it much more secure. All of these devices, I mean, you know, iOS is, is, is the best because Apple has the most control over the infrastructure where stuff goes out and it's repaired and fixed quickly, and they are being rewarded for that. Google with Android and it going out through Samsung, LG, and others are a little behind that, but they're a lot behind. They're a lot ahead of anybody else. Um, the other related things that are going on. Look at what Tesla is doing, where they also update their their cars for not only its own firmware, but other things. They did an update of the Roadster that they haven't sold for two years, where they came out with essentially an upgrade package with more battery life and this, that, the other thing. And that ends up meaning that the devices that you're buying that way are cheaper to you and better to you. And we as consumers are starting to reward the people who do that well. John, when we look at the security of the cloud, you know, when we first started talking about that as a, in the industry of security, we were like, well, we don't trust the cloud. Like, there's all these, it's basically controlled by software, which means anyone that's on these servers on the internet could potentially gain access to my data. I feel like we've gotten over that, right? And we're accepting that risk, but how viable is that, is that risk, risk today? And, and you mentioned cloud before, too, uh, as being popular on phones and stuff. Well, we're, you know, we're seeing some combination of things getting a lot worse, but they're also getting better because they are, in fact, being repaired quickly. Mm -hmm. The speed at which these problems is going used to be measured in months or years, and now it's in days or weeks. Um, by reusing components by using things that are open source and freely available, we are getting better systems all the time, but a lot of these better systems are frozen at their manufacture date and are not being ever updated. And that's the thing that we're gonna have to do is to come up with a way to update these systems, which is going to be part of support, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, updating is, is a big deal if you're, you're a cloud provider, right? But I feel like we've gotten better at that. Is, is that we just have. an infrastructure thing that's allowed them we to have. make these updates more quickly, right? Yeah. I mean, the major cloud providers are doing multiple deployments per day. Um, even other things, you're seeing them going very, very quickly where, like I said, you know, we consider right now an old app to be one that's three months old, not to be one that is, that is years old. So all of that old stuff is being flushed out of the way quickly. It's going to be how we take this Internet of Things. You know, when your refrigerator is on the net and it needs new firmware, where is it going to get that from? The cloud. Yeah, yeah. Well, the <laughs> manufacturer is really. Yeah. And right now, you know, we have this problem where the authentication of that firmware is not happening. Um, signing of that firmware is not happening to a large extent, which is troubling for me. I'm sure and, many of us, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you think we'll get there? We have to get there, right? We I have mean, to get there. Yeah. We, ha we have to get there and... As the devices that are available for these people to use get more and more powerful and capable of doing things, it will in fact happen. Um, I believe that there's probably going to have to be some sort of, uh, of 
regulation or quasi-regulation to kick some people in the butt. But we're moving in that direction just because there's going to be a time when not doing it is going to be negligence. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I implementing security like that is, is great, but it seems that a lot of it today especially comes down to passwords, right? It's Someone could have the most secure refrigerator in the world, but when they log into their cloud app to manage their refrigerator, they're entering a password. So what's yeah. your take on passwords? Like, is there a shelf life, you think, to passwords? Unfortunately, I don't know what we're going to replace them with. Mm. <laughs> uh, and therein lies the rub. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah cause, because um, there, there are things that you can do to mitigate that. I mean, what I'm doing in the apps for Silent Circle is that we have you, um, we call it provision the app, but you do a one-time login with your account name and password. And then we send from our servers a little data package that includes a full 128-bit random number that is used as the actual login Hmm. to the servers oh, wow. so that when your app logs in, it is logging in with essentially a username and password, but it's doing it without asking you and it's using a full 128-bit number over an encrypted link. And that way we make it so that you only rarely have to type in a password and only for maintenance issues that everything else just works. You just start the app and it works because the app's been provisioned to automatically authenticate itself into the back end. And this sort, of, this sort of creativity is where things are going to have to go. So it's not so much that we get rid of passwords, it's that we make them easier to use. <clears throat> and, and less frequent to use. Yeah. Um, yeah. There, there's, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not there yet, but there are things that kind of suggest where we, would, where we could go. I mean, for example, I have one of these new Google Authenticator tokens mm -hmm. that's made by YubiKey, and you can use it for a wide variety of things. If once every week or 10 days or something, I had this thing that I plugged into a USB port on my laptop and it did all of the right magic stuff for me, that would be okay. Um, if you look at what is going on with the way that the new iPhones are using fingerprints, that as a huge biometric cynic, what they are doing is that they are forcing you to type in a passcode once. And then until you reboot that computer, which is a computer that hardly ever gets rebooted, you only have to touch it with your finger. Yep. And, you know, and of course, if you do that three or five times wrong, it'll say, no, 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 you have to give me your passcode again. But it is permitting us to have longer, better passwords by extending them with other means. And I think that both biometrics and tokens can be something where we will end up having truly a long password that you can keep for 15 years because you're only ever typing it into a device that is under your control. It's not going over the network. Mm. That's interesting. Well, you know, too, I, and you already mm. talked about this in, in terms of the way you do it with um, Silent Circle and, and the black phone, but you know, we always look at the password and then we point at the memorability of passwords and people and the fallacy of people and all sorts of crap that doesn't really hold up. Um, but what we forget about is we don't need we don't protect the way that we transmit passwords very effectively, and we don't protect the back end systems very effectively. And and you've got you know at least three components to the system. And what I like about what you're describing is there's there's still a way to use that mechanism, but if you reduce the frequency of it and you strengthen the rest of the system, what we perceive as the problem today really seems to go away. Yes, absolutely, and. This was something that we started doing, oh, back in PGP days, where you could do something like one of the little encrypted virtual disks. You could either lock it with a passcode or you could lock it with your, with your, yep. your public key. 
And if you locked it with the public key, the user experience was exactly the same. But if you lost that encrypted disk because you know it was on a removable volume or something, they couldn't they couldn't run a password cracker on the removable disk. They right. had to crack really strong crypto. And by using these mechanism where the passcode is being used to unlock a key that is the real security token, I think we can strengthen the system as a whole. No, I love that. You know, by the way, too, just because I feel sometimes like the champion of passwords by default, the, the courts have recently ruled that you can be compelled to give up your biometric, but not compelled to give up your password. That's, that's basically always been true. They've recently upheld it then. Yeah. It's, and so well, it's, it's like one of those, hello, <laughs> we should stop crying about the password, just make it better. This is, well, this is something that is a Fifth Amendment issue. That's exactly right. That we have in the United States and relatively few other countries do that you can't be compelled to testify against yourself. But what they mean by that is legally a dance that we've done for a couple hundred years. Because you can be compelled to stand in a lineup. You can be compelled to have somebody take a picture of you. You can be compelled to give over a blood sample or a DNA sample. And similarly, if, you, if, if they have a warrant to open a safe, you can be compelled to give the key to that safe. That's right. So what constitutes testifying against yourself versus not? And nobody really wants to have to end up in really hinky things. So the guideline is that if it's in your head, you, it, it, it counts as testifying against yourself, hmm. which is why the you don't have to give up your password is, is there, but you might have to give up your biometric because your biometric is a fact, whereas the passcode is just barely on this other line of what constitutes um, testifying against yourself. And, and it's never been fully decided and it's always debated, but the real guideline is if it's in your head, it's testifying. If it's a fact, then it's just physics. So, John, what, what's next for Silent Circle and Black Phone? Well, we have announced that we're coming out with a new phone. Mm -hmm. That will be out this summer. We are working on a larger format device, which we're calling Black Phone Plus, and it is, it <laughs> is a, a seven-inch device. It, it's a tablet, mm -hmm. but the thing that we are that we are doing with that is that we are seeing the lines between tablets and phones crossing. Hmm. You know, there's now a Samsung phone that is smaller than the, sorry, it's Samsung tablet that is smaller than the largest phone they make. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> so what we've said is, look, we're, you know, bigger screen real estate has a lot of obvious uses and we're making a larger device because it makes sense for a lot of things like conference calling and other and mm. other uses to have a larger format device looking at documents you want larger but the actual difference between a phone and a tablet especially for us when we're doing calling over the internet and and we're trying to make it so that the voice connection that you have into the device that's a cellular voice thing is sort of a legacy thing, you're doing everything over the network anyway, so then what is the difference between it other than screen size? So we're working on, on new devices. We are working on new services that we could do that are secure services and how to provide those to people. Um, we're also on the device end, we've come up with our own uh, you know, I'll put quotes around it and say store. 
but it is a way that you can get apps that have gotten some sort of seal of approval on it. Mm -hmm. And that could be anything at the low level of we ourselves have gone and looked at it, and yes, indeed, they have a privacy policy. They seem to be following their privacy policy. They don't snooker you into doing like a flashlight app that grabs your address book. Mm -hmm. And then at the high end, that we will have done a code review on it. Hmm. And, and that ends up with different categories of service where you can know that, that this is, at, say, the bottom end, the same Facebook app that you could get from anywhere else, and, and, you know, and we are a source of it for you, all the way up to here's an app that, that we and the maker made a code review of it, and gosh, it's really good. Hmm. That's really cool. Uh, you know what I love about that, by the way? You're, you're embedding the opportunity for security without calling it security. It's, it's like when the banks say, hey, would you like to protect your account? It's an extra five bucks a month. And people go, yeah, yeah. And you're offering to say, how would you like us to put a level of assurance on that so you're getting what, what you want to do your, right? It's, it's, the, it's the adage of, uh, you know, people don't buy the drill. They, they buy the holes that they want in the wood or the, the walls or whatever. I love how you're doing that. That that is that's, that's, that's awesome. a lot of that's thank you very much that's a lot of what we're doing is that we're trying to look at what people really want in their system and if what they want is a way to know that this thing isn't going to hurt them and then they're willing to pay for it one way or another um, then we can start providing that that's great Awesome. John, are you ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? <laughs> no, but I, I suppose that that doesn't matter, does it? It does not. <laughs> <laughs> John, three words to describe yourself. All right. Curious, enthusiastic, smart. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? <laughs> um, um, nuclear weapons. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Gosh. That one's hard. It's not the most difficult one, traditionally. Yeah. I'm warning you. Okay. <laughs> all, all right. All right. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to say on security. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? <laughs> I'm going to have to intuit what you mean by Ask Grabby Grabby. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I'll say I'll go first. Choose two celebrities to be your parents. Um, Alive or Hepburn, dead? Catherine Hepburn and Jimmy Stewart. Very nice. Good very choice. Nice. Thanks for playing along, John. And thank you very much for appearing on Security Weekly. You can go purchase your black phone, although those of us that listen to the interview will probably uh, be anxiously awaiting what the new phone comes out uh, this summer, you said, right? It comes out this summer. They're available from store.blackphone.ch. Excellent. John, thank you very much. Thank you as well. And with that, we're going to take a short break, come back with our next feature interview for the show, who's sitting right next to me. We haven't introduced him yet. There he is. So you'll fi figure out who that is on the next segment. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. <laughs> 